Hi, uh, great to see everybody here. I'm, I'm really excited to be talking to you about crypto in 2020, why we're quite optimistic about the outlook, and so I think all of you guys should be quite optimistic. But I want to share with you some sort of non-consensus and non-traditional thoughts about the market as well. And I'll be sharing the stage later with one of our uh, newest additions to Fundstrat, David Greider, uh, who is one of our head digital asset researchers. But before going to this, I wanted to give you a bit of an overview of our company, because you might see us on TV or you might troll us on Twitter, um, but you may not have a full understanding of, of our business. Uh, so Fundstrat was founded five years ago. Uh, this data is quite old. We have over 220 uh, institutional investor clients in 18 countries. And our audience uh, really was built on serving traditional financial institutions uh, they collectively manage about 80% of all the money in the world. So we are really uh, very in touch with how they think about the world. And one of our uh, most controversial sort of additions of our work has been the focus on uh, digital assets, which is here, crypto. So we have two types of crypto products that you may come across, Fundstrat Digital Assets and Fundstrat Digital Assets Consulting, which is really project-focused work. And if you want to follow us, uh, you know, many of you might find us on Twitter at Fundstrat. You have to remember less than 1% of our insights and content are actually on Twitter. So if you do want to try to follow us, uh, we'd encourage you to go to, uh, if you're a financial institution, Fundstrat.com, or if you're an individual or a financial advisor, FSInsight.com. Okay, so I've got a, this talk broken up into a couple parts. And the first part I want to talk about is why I think 2020 uh, is the start, actually really a continuation of a bull market in crypto, one that I think is going to look a lot like the past cycles, which uh, let's say 2017 is an example where you could have tremendous returns. And uh, first of all, let's just start with this chart. One, uh, a new bull market's already underway because last year crypto was the single best performing asset class. It did three times the return of traditional equities. And as 2020 has started, you can see that uh, already the best performing asset class, again, is crypto. So uh, two years in a row, this, the best way to be exposed to financial assets has been to own crypto assets. Uh, but more importantly, uh, when you look at crypto, you really have to realize that under a bull market, uh, a lot of cryptocurrency specifics, uh, specifically while performing, you can see since September, the best performing crypto asset has been Bitcoin SV. And uh, how else do we know that crypto is in a bull market? If we took Bitcoin Core as an example, the thing to watch is the 200-day moving average. That number is 8,900. As long as Bitcoin Core is above 8,900, we would view this as the start of a new bull market. Why does the 200-day matter? Uh, just take a look at this chart. Whenever, in the, in the 11 years of history, when Bitcoin is above its 200-day average, its six-month return averages 193%, and it's up 80% of the time. So again, once you break your 200-day, you know, we view this as evidence we're in a bull market. And I'm gonna fly through some of these because I really wanna talk to you about some key thoughts. Uh, 2020 is also showing a change in correlation of crypto to traditional markets. This dark line is the correlation to the equity market. And as you can see, last year, crypto was positively correlated to equities. But because of geopolitical tensions and the coronavirus, we've actually seen that correlation reverse, meaning crypto has now become a hedge against calamity. And that's, that's a good thing to see this number go negative. And uh, one last thought, the halvening for proof of work, especially for Bitcoin uh, legacy uh, cryptocurrencies, the halvening is a big deal. And we think this, is, this and next year will be positive catalysts as well. All right, but let me actually spend some time talking to you about non-conventional thoughts about crypto. And the three I want to spend some time on is, number one, as much as we know institutions will play a big role in crypto, over the next five years, we think that the primary source of fiat to crypto inflows is actually going to be retail. Uh, doesn't mean institutions aren't watching. They are, but it's the real money is coming from retail. The second unconventional thought is as much as people think crypto is more important outside the US, over the next five years, the most important market actually is going to be the US. 
And third, uh, and this is an evolution of our thinking, we think crypto is less about replacing money, and it's more about disrupting the traditional banking industry and all activity around that. Okay, so let me start with why crypto is probably more of a retail business than institutional. Now, many of you guys, uh, if I asked, you know, how big is crypto as a percentage of traditional assets, you might think it's 10% of the market, or even guess it's 1% of the market. <clears throat> Reality is crypto as a percentage of traditional liquid assets is 0.1%. So think about that. It's, it's a lot smaller than people realize. And to give you some perspective, each of these boxes is roughly $200 billion. And you can see the global bond market's 86 trillion. Global stocks are 68 trillion. Art, it's a huge market, it's 17 trillion. Gold is a $9 trillion market. Real estate's 230 trillion. And if you see in the corner, that tiny little box is crypto. So you could see if you recommend a 2% overweight, a 2% exposure to crypto, which is our firm's recommendation to clients, that's 20 times the exposure of the overall market. So by telling clients we need they have to have 2% in Bitcoin and crypto, that's a massive, massive overweight given the size of the market. Now, what does this mean? Well, one, institutions aren't going to pay attention to something that's 0.1% of the financial world. They're going to pay attention when it becomes 1% or 2%, because then they do a 1% allocation, their market weight, that exposure. So in other words, until crypto is roughly 10 times bigger in aggregate market cap, it's largely a retail market. Now, that's really good news for everybody here, because you, know, you can do your own asset allocations and know that the institutions are only watching. Now, what happens when institutions start buying crypto? Well, FOMO is going to kick in. And you guys think, well, what, what, how can FOMO move markets? I've got a good example of a recent instance of institutional FOMO developing. Uh, this is Tesla. Okay, so you guys all know Tesla. Um, this is a five-year price chart. You can see for five years, institutions largely considered this a cult stock, dead money, because it was kind of stuck in a range. Okay, that's the dead money there. And you can see in the last four months, Tesla has gone parabolic. Now, a lot of skeptics would say this is short covering. We've done a lot of work, we've published this for our clients, but we've shown that most of the buying for Tesla has been Russell 1000 fund managers who ignored the stock who suddenly needed exposure. How much did it move Tesla? Well, see each of these red bars there? That's 100 points in the stock price, okay? Each 100 point red bar, red line, is $18 billion of market cap. In four months, institutions which went from an underweight in Tesla to just a market exposure, which is 0.7% exposure to Tesla, added $140 billion of market cap. So just think about that. The day institutions decide they want to be market weight crypto, you're going to see the same kind of parabolic move almost in an instant. So I think, you know, again, it's good news that crypto is not an institutional product just yet. But uh, another not conventional thought we have is that the U.S. may matter more than you realize. This is global household net worth, okay? Uh, it's from Credit Suisse. Today, three households own $300 trillion of global assets. I mean, incredibly rich. I mean, households basically have net worth equal to four times GDP. But that money is concentrated. You can see the U.S. is 98 trillion, so one-third of all the money in the world is held in the U.S. 51 trillion is China, and Japan is 24. Those are the three most important countries when you think about asset allocation. It's over 60% of the money. So again, uh, as much as we might think developments in Europe or other regions are important, the three to most important regions to watch is U.S., China, and Japan, the most important being the U.S. More importantly, the U.S., uh, now this is from Garrick Heilman. He did this, something called the Bitcoin Market Potential Index. It's really a top five in terms of potential adoption for crypto. So going, when you marry this chart 
With this chart, you can see the US is not only the most likely to see huge, massive adoption of crypto, but also the largest market. And finally, a third reason the US will matter is this chart. This is wealth held in America by generation. Over 76% of the money in, in, the, in the US today, 76 trillion, is held by people over age 60. But in the next 20 years, 68 trillion of that will be inherited by millennials. Now, we've done a lot of demographic work at Fundstrat to show that millennials are the only real drivers of the US economy in the next 20 years, but they're gonna inherit the wealth equivalent of China and Japan combined. And we know millennials are much more pro-crypto than traditional investors. So this process of inheritance is also going to drive crypto adoption. OK, and the third, third non-conventional thought we have on crypto is that there is a huge opportunity for crypto to disrupt traditional financial systems. Now, uh, if you live in the US, you may realize a lot of people are OK with how banking works today because they don't realize how expensive it is. Using data from the OECD, Banking today captures 6% of all the activity of the economy, meaning for every $100 of stuff that you guys do, six cents is paid to the banking industry to enable that transaction. That means that the average person spends three and a half weeks a year, almost a month of their salary, to pay for the right to use the financial system. And in the US, that works out to about $1,000 per year and just consider that Facebook generates $25 a year per person. So banks, who you probably never talk to, don't even know, don't even deal with, make 40 times as much money off you as Facebook does. And that number has grown. So the left chart shows you interest rates since 1970. And you can see that interest rates in the last 50 years have collapsed. Yet the banking industry's share of the economy has almost doubled. So Banking is not free, it's quite expensive for the average person. Okay, so let me uh, sort of get to my third part here, which is as much as we're optimistic about uh, the future for digital assets and the adoption and, and cryptocurrencies in 2020, I also think it's important to realize that the future is uncertain. And what I mean by that is, there's two ways investors make money when they look at what they call factor performance. One is what you call uh, a, an asset allocation, you know, being in the right space at the right time. And the second is being a good stock picker or picking the right winner, the horses. We think it's much more important to be in the right vector. In other words, make the right asset allocation. And to really illustrate this, uh, these are the FANG stocks, Amazon, Netflix, Google, Facebook, and they've been spectacular stocks. Uh, winners, and if we all had foresight, or we could go back in time, if we just put all of our money into these things, we'd all be richer than uh, Jeff Bezos. But here's something that most people don't realize. If you look at the price performance of these stocks, 75% of the return is just explained by the growth in the number of internet users from the time they were formed. In other words, it was more important to bet on internet than necessarily pick these four, these four companies as the winner. And how does that translate into crypto? Well, i just give you a simple example. In 2013, using CoinMarketCap, these were the 10 largest cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin, Litecoin, number 10 was CHN coin. In the past seven years, only two of those are still in the top 10. So what that means is, if the markets were efficient in 2013, 80% of what the market had priced in proved to be incorrect. But let's look at 2017, that's only three years ago. Of the top 10 cryptocurrencies, only four are still top 10, which means that the market has evolved so that 60% of what was priced in just three years ago proved to be incorrect. The point is, you have to remember the future is uncertain. Um, but one of the things to watch is, of course, adoption. You know, we think the key to the growth of any cryptocurrency is going to be the adoption rate, which uh, today I think the benchmark is ultimately Visa, MasterCard is the, is the metric we want uh, cryptocurrencies to have, and that's a 
X increase in total active addresses. That's why you should be optimistic. And as you can see, this has really been a good way to think about the market because uh, the X axis here is active addresses. The Y axis is network value. No matter what project you look at, active addresses and network value are highly correlated. And that ties into network effect assets in general. The dollar's an example, most social media companies, cryptocurrencies as well. And that's why I think the key is, how do you make crypto more useful? Now, I want to bring on stage uh, our senior di digital a asset researcher, David Greider. Uh, so David, you can come over here. He joined us this year. Uh, he was previously involved with Enigma Ventures, a digital asset investment bank. And now he's uh, done a lot of work, and he's actually going to be leading a lot of the project research. So I'm going to turn it over to David. Thank you, Tom. So as Tom mentioned, I lead a lot of the project-specific research that we do at Fundstrat. Tom focuses a lot on the macro portfolio allocation, the crypto um, weightings, but I look at deep down the stack on the sector, uh, individual projects, projects like Bitcoin SV, projects across the ecosystem. And what we do is we work with clients, both on the institutional side and both on the project side to help provide better education and investor awareness. And one way we do that that's been very valuable for our clients is these reports that you see here and that you can find here in some of these chairs in the front and you may have seen online. And if you follow us on Fundstrat and you're following the Bitcoin Association very closely, you will have seen those and you should be. And we encourage you to pick them up after this conference if you haven't. I'm not going to rehash what we've put out in the latest report from uh, the Genesis upgrade. I highly encourage you to read it. But what I will talk about is the reason we do some of the research we do, why we feel it's incredibly important and pivotal to the industry and the space. And the other part of what I'll talk about is Bitcoin SV, the reason you all are here and very excited. So who, if I can take a survey, got involved in this general crypto space back in, let's say 2017. Can I have a show of hands? Great. And then let's think back to the previous uh, bull market cycle that we saw. Uh, who was involved in uh, 2013 and 14? And then, you know, Calvin, maybe we'll have you and Craig raise your hand. 2011, any, any old timers? Congratulations. Mm. You newer folks, you might know there's a lot of misinformation and there's a lot of difficulty finding accuracy of information on projects in the space. I can't tell you how much better it is today, and it was in 2017 than when it was when I first started really deep diving into crypto and digital assets in 2015. And you were literally, you're looking at Reddit forums, you're digging through block explorers, it's nearly impossible. In 2013, that's one of the reasons that I didn't get into crypto sooner, but it was because it was so difficult to find information. And our job and our goal that we're trying to do is we're trying to provide that credible, transparent, reliable information to institutional clients about projects like Bitcoin SV. And we believe that's really important for adoption in the long term. Because the problem we see is, I think with you look at Bitcoin SV and you look at the way it's evolved and you look at the way the communities form narratives around what projects are doing, we think that your vision that you have for the way your protocol should operate and should function, really can sometimes get misportrayed by other folks who maybe have a different view. And we don't think that that's the right way for a market to evolve properly and to provide transparency and pricing. And we believe that it's our best interest to help provide that to the market and, and tell your story. So what we do when we're doing a deep dive on our research and our clients for projects like Bitcoin SV is we look at, we do a deep overview of what the projects are doing, what its use cases are, deep dive into the tech, how that works, the key features, the trade-offs that projects like Bitcoin SV are making, and look at where they are in the landscape to try to provide a fair and accurate assessment of what you guys are doing, why you're uniquely positioned, and why you're different from the rest of the projects that are out there. And I think that that message sometimes gets lost when folks just try to, you know, paint the view of whether their project is better or not without looking at facts. And we're data-driven in that way. So if we look at the approach you guys are taking when it comes to scalability, 
we think it's actually very uniquely positioned you in the market. We haven't seen anyone else across the space, and you probably know this as Bitcoin as the uh, proponents, but we have to educate clients a lot on why this is a very differentiated value proposition for building um, an economy that allows for you know, enterprise usage and building a data economy. And we think that that's very important for you guys in terms of a competitive advantage in a few key areas that you're trying to accomplish in your use case relative to other people in other projects who maybe aren't the exact same, but you get bucketed with. And we think it's a very important thing that you're working on as well, because I think folks also misunderstand the application of the metanet that you guys are seeking to build. And there are some problems with the internet that I think you guys are uniquely addressing. And that when the metanet, as it's being rolled out, I think that the success of it will be key to making our society as a whole better. And I think that we all here know a lot of the problems that exist with the internet. If you think about things like the hacking scandals, the censorship that you see, the data privacy issues, you think about things like the platform politicization, these are important problems to solve. And we think that the MetaNet proposal and the upgrade you guys have done, congratulations on accomplishing it, by the way, takes really good steps towards achieving that goal. And we look at the unbounded scalability that you guys are seeking to offer, and we find that to be very encouraging. And we also look at the scripting language and the smart contracting um, capabilities that you guys are offering and re-enabled back with your vision of what the protocol should be, and we find that encouraging as well. It's something that we don't see in the same combination together with any of the larger projects that exist today, and I think that that is something that we should all strive for, is a new approach towards going to market and finding that right product market fit. Because as Tom said, it is still early, and the future is still uncertain, and we think there's still a lot of opportunity. And we're very excited as well about some of the projects that are building on top of, of the uh, Bitcoin SV ecosystem. A number of projects that are here today and that will be talking to you guys further and we're excited to listen to them and have deep dives into what they have to say about how they are interacting with the Bitcoin SV ecosystem. But we don't just look at surface level what the projects are and what's going on. We look in deep dives at what's actually happening on chain and understanding the data. And I think the data is the key because we are data driven and we have to know if there's people building on Bitcoin SV, how are they using it and how much is that use translating back into the ecosystem and the value. So one thing I want to point out is, I think this has been, this is known amongst a number of people, but the transaction counts are very strong, which tells us that there is a lot of usage that's happening in the Bitcoin SV ecosystem and that's something to be excited about. And you guys are capable of being in line with low transaction fees which is a real differentiator that we think is very powerful as well. The price, we, all, we can't uh, not talk about it. I think it's worth noting that you guys have uh, done well uh, prior to this conference, and we think that that's really being driven to a large degree by the fundamental improvements that we've seen. And we think that that's very encouraging. And if we look at when the run-up is, I think that folks are probably pricing in the success of the, the Genesis upgrade, uh, the MetaNet vision coming in, and we think that that's a very encouraging thing to be happening with the ecosystem. But if we're looking forward, right, what, what keeps improving the fundamentals, right? What keeps your ecosystem growing and what keeps delivering success to any project like Bitcoin SV? We think it's new fundamental ways of uh, evolving the ecosystem and adding to that user growth. And we look at things like uh, the transaction fee economy uh, that you guys are uh, a number of the mining groups are trying to propose and build to enable greater growth. And we think that that could be one of the next catalysts towards onboarding more applications and getting more users and greater growth that translates back to fundamental adoption for the Bitcoin SV ecosystem. And that's something that we're excited about and we'll be watching closely. Thank you. Hi, I'm Hannah Jackson for CoinGeek.com, and I'm here with Thomas Lee, one of the keynote speakers here at the conference in London. Now, first of all, you have done a lot of extensive research into BSV, but what were the particular characteristics that really piqued your interest in this particular blockchain? Well, I think there are some really unique features that make BSV, something that we want to pay attention to, you know, one is really the high throughput, the large block sizes. It really does seem to be a pretty burgeoning community as well for something that's really been in the marketplace for about a year. I think that there's a tendency for people to think, you know, crypto is only about, you know, store value, 
uh, slow blocks, and I think that there's going to be many winners, and so that's why we want to pay attention to a lot of projects. Hmm. Let's talk about the upcoming happening and how that compared to the first one. What are your thoughts? I think the same dynamics are going to be at play. You know, let's assume demand is constant, but you're cutting supply. The way that solves itself is a rise in price. So we're pretty optimistic about the cryptocurrency market, especially the proof of work chain seeing a big rise because of the happening. Mm -hmm. So do you think that Bitcoin is a really positive thing for the world? Yes, absolutely. It makes trust. It really takes it away from a lot of centralized entities. I think it's important for people to preserve money. It's a good way to move money around the world. And really, a new generation of people are finding a lot of use for it. All right. Well, looking, uh, you know, for you particularly and Bitcoin in general into the future, maybe the next couple of years, what, what do you want to see coming out of it? We want to see wider adoption and especially large traditional institutions start to use crypto. And we want to see a broader holder set, you know, both more retail investors owning cryptocurrencies, but also we expect more financial institutions start to use it as an asset class. Yes. Fantastic, very exciting times ahead.